Welcome back to this uh, second mini lecture on Hobbes. In the first mini lecture, to summarize, uh, Hobbes agrees with Machiavelli that power is the most important uh, variable uh, in politics. He also agrees with Machiavelli uh, that people are self interested, they can't uh, be trusted to govern because of egoism and self interest. That obviously, if people are consumed by self-interest, democracy is really doomed because democracy is going to be nothing more than mobocracy and people pursuing their own selfish interests. And without government, of course, uh, people uh, are going to do anything to better their positions. And uh, without government, people would be left to themselves to act on their own evil impulses. So people form government to escape what Hobbes calls this wretched state of nature, which I'm going to talk about uh, in just a couple of minutes. Um, and I talked about governments are formed not mystically, not divinely inspired by God. Uh, they're not natural organisms, but they're formed by a contract. So government is artificial created by the people, right, who are fearful, self-interested, but rational. And government exists to serve the people in the sense of providing them order, security, a rule of law, etc. So in this mini lecture, let me go back to the view of human nature and repeat a couple things from last time and then expand on it. Uh, if you're following along in the notes, go down to Item number four, Hobbes's view of human nature. I mentioned in the last lecture that Hobbes is a utilitarian, and by a utilitarian, he believes that our urges of pleasure and pain dominate over our intellect. People have a natural lust for power, and we read that in the Federalist Papers. Uh, people like James Madison and Alexander Hamilton uh, use this term they use the term natural lust for domination. Hobbes uses the term natural lust for power. They're pretty interchangeable. And of course, they seek power because it allows us to pursue what is pleasurable. And this natural lust for power means that the true state of nature, and by state of nature, I mean, what if government did not exist? Uh, imagine a state you can either think about maybe historical states where government didn't exist, or more likely, uh, in this particular case, a mental construct. Uh, but, but the point for Hobbes was, if government did not exist, if people lived in a state of nature, and uh, this would probably make a very good exam question, right, when I ask you for Hobbes's view of the state of nature. Well, he believed that it would be warlike. It would be solitary, nasty, brutish, and short, a state of perpetual uh, warfare uh, that kind of ceaseth only in death. So his belief is without government, our lust for power would bring us into competition with one another. And uh, that in this particular case, because we are rational creatures, because we understand that if government did not exist, that life would be hellish. And because the only right people have is the right of self-preservation, we escape this wretched condition and form the social contract. So, as I mentioned earlier, the social contract is created by fearful, rational individuals who understand that strong government is needed to enforce rules and people willingly and gladly are willing to trade freedom and equality for the security order rule of law that we find in organized society so government provides order and security uh, and obviously if i ask you what was the primary political value for Thomas Hobbes? It's order. In fact, he, he claims that freedom and equality only have any meaning at all 
only if you have order as a prerequisite. Hobbes goes on to talk about what would life be like without government. And he says, without government, the weak would form alliances to kill the stronger. And so in essence, equality, which you and I today claim as something that's very good, at least the majority of us do, this equality makes it without government so that every man has the ability in the state of nature to threaten one another's lives. It creates a security dilemma. I didn't write that in the notes, but that's what he implies. And equality for our purposes, for Hobbes's purposes, means that every man is rational and has the ability to consent to be governed and is willing to give that consent in order to survive. So people form government out of a need for self-preservation and uh, government is perpetuated by fear of the alternative. Now, I mentioned in the last mini lecture that Hobbes is not a Democrat, even though I would claim that Hobbes's political philosophy has some of the cornerstones of democratic theory. The notion that government is artificial, the fact that government is created by the people, that government has a task to serve the people, to protect their livelihoods. Government created by the people and for the people. It's not too far from Abraham Lincoln. Now, obviously, Thomas Hobbes is no Abraham Lincoln. He's not an advocate for democracy. He's an advocate for a strong monarch. But he angers the monarchs as well. The reason why Hobbes has to flee England is he says in the Leviathan that political power does not come from God that the kings of England did not get their political authority from God. They got their authority from the people. And of course, if I'm a king in England, I don't like this at all. Because if I can make the claim that political power came from God, only God can take it away. As soon as I acknowledge that the only reason I'm the king is because the people consented and gave me this authority, then the people, under certain circumstances, might claim the authority to take my political power away. So Hobbes has the parliamentarians mad because he doesn't like a republic. He likes a democracy. I mean, he likes a monarchy because it's expedient. He believes that democracies are squabbling and don't get anything done and will break down. So he's not saying that a strong monarch is morally superior. A strong monarch is not superior because God has placed power in their hands. Remember, he's a utilitarian. Is it useful? He believes that a strong monarchy is useful because a strong monarch is the best bet to provide order and security for that society. As the notes say, a monarch is much more efficient than a republic. So Hobbes rejects limited government. Uh, he rejects democracy, again saying that a democracy is merely a bunch of self-interested individuals, none of whom have the public interest in mind. And uh, in this particular case, Hobbes makes a statement that I gave you earlier with the ancient Greeks. And here's one area where probably I agree with Hobbes, where he says a bad government is far worse than no government at all. It's obviously something that none of us want. Bad governments result in tyranny, and tyranny results in the abuse and destructions of individual civil liberties and rights, so you certainly don't want tyranny. But Hobbes concentrates on the alternative. You see, most people before him had concentrated on, well, what are the effects of bad government and how do we move bad government to good government, however you define it? For Hobbes, though, his emphasis is, what if government didn't exist at all? What if governmental authority broke down and people lived without government, that state that Hobbes calls the state of nature? 
Well, if you read Hobbes, it would be a warlike conditions. People's very livelihood would be called into question. And that's why he comes to the conclusion that a bad government is worse than no government at all. Uh, Hobbes makes a unique claim, right? And it's an odd one. It's the last thing in your notes. Remember, in a social contract, both parties have obligations. So for Hobbes, the obligation of the people in the social contract is to obey the law. And if they don't, maybe they get punished. Maybe they get thrown in jail. Maybe if they commit a crime horrific enough, maybe they get executed. Now, Hobbes says that the monarch is above the law because the monarch created the law. But he is only above the law if he can provide order and security because that's his duty. His duty is to provide order, security, and to protect the lives of the people in his society or her society, if we are dealing with a queen. And if the monarch cannot do that, then the monarch is breaking the social contract. The people always reserve the right of self-defense. And if the monarch cannot provide social order and protect the livelihood of the people, then the people have the right to depose the monarch and to make a contract with a monarch that can provide their livelihood. And so it's really intriguing in this particular case, this idea of a social contract, that political power comes from the people, that people form government through contract, that both have obligations, and that if the government cannot fulfill its obligation or task, the people can depose the monarch. And that's exactly what we do in the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson and the boys claim that there are 56 different ways that King George III has violated the social contract that he has with us, his subjects. And therefore, since he is violating the social contract he has with us, his subjects, we have not only the right, but the moral duty to revolt. So it's intriguing that this man, Thomas Hobbes, who is a monarchist, gives us this notion that government is created by rational individuals in a social contract, and that it leads not to a monarchical revolution, but a revolt against a monarch. And we get the first social contract theory revolution with the American Revolution, the first time in the history of the world that a colony separates itself from a mother country, and our revolution is justified using the language of social contract theory. And in the next uh, two mini lectures, I will move away from Hobbes to a more optimistic individual, John Locke. Uh, John Locke, I kind of view him as the intellectual guru for Thomas Jefferson. Uh, we will talk about Locke, his influence on the American Revolution and classic liberalism. Uh, and in the lectures, I'll then give you a couple of criticisms of Locke uh, through the lens of Karl Marx, who's usually seen as the father of communism, or at least of modern communism, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau in his advocacy for extreme direct democracy. So we are done with Hobbes, but I will refer back to him and contrast him with Locke in the two Locke mini lectures. Hope you're having a great week uh, and great day, and uh, I will be uh, back again real soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye.